friends. Hello, I am William Henry Curry, the music director of the Durham Symphony Orchestra. And this is our Monday musicale with a maestro. Today we're celebrating the Martin Luther King holiday. And the title of our blog is Sharing the Spirit of Martin's Dream. I was born in 1954, the year of Brown versus Board of Education. Every African-American parent who had a child born that year said of the child, perhaps he or she will have a brighter future. Now, my most influential parent was my mother. It was she that introduced me to the glory of reading and culture and classical music. And current events was extremely important in the Curry home. So in August 1963, the Curry family gathered around the television set to watch Martin Luther King give his famous I Have a Dream speech during one of the largest political rallies in American history. The crowd at this protest march was estimated at 250,000 people. According to Wikipedia, 75 to 8% of the attendees were African American. The purpose of this march on Washington for jobs and freedom was the lobby for civil rights and economic equality for African Americans. According to the New York Daily News, an account from the next day, more than 6,000 police, parade marshals, and military MPs were deployed throughout the Capitol to prevent any violence. Some 4,000 troops were kept on alert at two nearby bases. But as the Great March and Memorial Rally came to an end, there had been only three arrests for minor violations, none by African Americans. It was a day of joy and optimism. But it was with a different feeling entirely that my family watched the funeral of Dr. King in April 1968. Of course, he had been assassinated right before an important speech in Memphis. Dr. King left behind a wonderful family, four young children, a loving wife, and a civil rights movement now that had lost its principal leader. We watched this funeral on TV, and I was 14 at the time. And I had never been to a funeral or seen one on TV. And my most vivid memory of that broadcast was I assumed everyone would be in tears. Everyone would be crying. But if you've ever been to a funeral, you know that by this time the tears are all dried out and people are just numb with shock and horror at the reality of seeing a loved one in a box in front of them. So these two haunting memories, the funeral and this majestic march on Washington, well, this led to something very positive some 30 years later with a piece I wrote called Eulogy for a Dream. And the idea of writing this piece came from the widow of Dr. King, Coretta Scott King. She was known as the first lady of the civil rights movement. Not only was she a prominent member of that struggle, but she was also a fervent advocate for women's equality and LGBTQ rights. What may be less well known is that in her teens, she wanted to be a classical singer. And she was so talented, she got a full scholarship to study at the New England Conservatory of Music in Boston, which is where Florence Price studied. We know all about her these days, her music being resurrected after being forgotten for 50 years after her death. It was at a party in Boston where Coretta Scott King met her future husband. My association with Mrs. King began in 1985. I was then the associate conductor of the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra. And at that time, I was programming a great deal of contemporary music. And in my research, I found a wonderful new work by Pulitzer Prize winning composer, Joseph Schwantner. The piece was called New Morning for the World, Daybreak of Freedom. And so I called up the composer. I said, this work that you've written is magnificent, calls for a speaker reading the words of Martin Luther King. Has anyone ever thought of asking his widow 
to read these words. And he laughed and he said, no, she's so important, doing so many more important things that, of course, no one had ever thought of asking her. So I left it just there. And so I began thinking of other people that might do the piece. Of course, I kept thinking it'd be great if she could do it. Well, my partner at the time, Michael, said, well, why don't you just call her up at the King Center in Atlanta and ask her if she would do it? I said, no, that's, that's too audacious. And Schwander said she would never do it. And Michael was silent and just left the room. Well, the next 10 minutes, he was quite busy. Unbeknownst to me, he had found the number for the King Center and had called up the King Center. He came into the room with a phone, handed it to me and said, Mrs. King is on the line and she would like to talk to you. It never hurts to ask. So I talked to Credit Scott King and we had a great conversation for about an hour. I told her about this composition, how excited I was about it. And a few days later, she agreed to perform it. Well, of course, we were all thrilled, and things moved very, very, very quickly after that. About a month later, here it was. I was picking her up at the airport in a limousine to take her from the airport to the concert hall so we could rehearse this piece. And so we had a wonderful conversation in a limousine. She was very warm, very gracious. She made me feel very, very at ease. And she was magnificent at the morning rehearsal and the evening performance. Afterwards, in accepting compliments, she was very modest, saying, well, I do know Martin's words, and I brought with me to the reception my orchestral score of Schwantner's piece in the hopes that she might autograph it for me, and she did. And of course, it's one of my prized possessions to this day, and this is what it says. For Bill Curry, my warmest and personal appreciation for our moments of sharing the spirit of Martin's dream, Coretta Scott King. So Joseph Schwantner, of course, was very excited about this, and he did attend the performance and was there at the reception, and all three of us had a wonderful conversation. And during this reception, I had some quiet time with Coretta Scott King, just her and I. And I don't know how the conversation got started, but I told her, one of my secret dreams was also to be a composer. Now, I had composed some in my teen years, but I gave that up in college because I wanted to concentrate on being a good conductor, and I didn't want to dilute my talent or my interest. But still, the idea of becoming a composer was always in my mind. I talked to the great American composer Aaron Copeland about this, and he said, well, you know, if you're a composer, you're also in competition with Mozart and Beethoven. So what you have to write has to be very good. And so that's a daunting thing to be told that it's got to be competitive with the greatest minds in, in music history. But Mrs. King heard all this, and she said very simply, life is a series of challenges. If you want to do that, go for it. She encouraged me. She also suggested that I might one day want to write my own piece using her husband's words for a narrator and orchestra. Well, to me, this is an absolutely impossible dream, and I absolutely put that idea away. But three years later, I did begin to compose again. And I began practicing writing melodies because I wanted my music to be melodic and lyrical and romantic. And so in 1999, in June, I conducted the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra in the premiere of my King piece that uses his words my eulogy for a dream, this piece that Coretta Scott King had suggested. Now in this work, we are to imagine we are attending Dr. King's funeral. Memories of civil rights marches are evoked with hymn-like music and the frequent quotation of, we shall overcome. The orchestra depicts the deep sadness of the occasion, as well as the radiant memories of a life dedicated to a glorious cause. A speaker reads from the writings of Dr. King. Now, at the time I wrote this work, the mid-1990s, I was going through the proverbial midlife crisis. And I chose these words and these sentiments because they had a special meaning for me. They helped to heal 
me. I am grateful that listeners have also found the words to be healing and universally beloved. Well, the artist's response to this piece at the world premiere was more than gratifying. The audience was on its feet with a stand ovation even before the work ended. I was so beyond happy to share the experience with Michael, who was there. Of course, it was Michael that had brought Mrs. King to this performance because I didn't have the courage to ask for her myself. And it was Michael that had given the piece its title. I'm always stuck for a vivid title that can also connect to the piece. So he thought of the title, Eulogy for a Dream, which refers to funeral music, the word eulogy, and the dream, I have a dream, eulogy for a dream. Now, since that world premiere in 99, it's been heard all over America on NPR's radio show, In Performance Today. And over a dozen American orchestras have performed it, including the North Carolina Symphony, the Indianapolis Symphony, the Nashville Symphony, the Toledo Symphony. In 09, the work received its Asian premiere in Taiwan. And it's been narrated for, by some very famous people, including William Warfield, the greatest Porgy in Gershwin's Porgy and Bess, Magnificent Opera, wonderful TV actor Avery Brooks, and Jubilant Sykes a wonderful gospel singer, as well as the mayor of Toledo. But in January 2017, during the DSO's MLK celebration with Duke University, I decided I would like for once to read these words myself. And of course, it was a great privilege and honor. The performance was conducted by DSO's assistant conductor and principal second violinist, Shelley Livingston. She and the orchestra both did a wonderful job. Now, our DSO feature today is a recording of that performance, which was broadcast by our local classical station, WCPE, the next year on the 50th anniversary of King's death. As the composer of Eulogy for a Dream, I had as my collaborator one of the most inspirational people and eloquent wordsmiths in human history, Martin Luther King. This music was written from the heart. We hope you enjoy it, and I hope it goes to your heart. I have decided that I am going to do battle for my philosophy. You ought to believe something in life. Believe that thing so fervently that you will stand up with it to the end of your days. Life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? A person has not started living until he can rise above the narrow confines of his personal concerns to the broader concerns of all humanity. The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. The true neighbor will risk his position, his prestige, and even his life for the welfare of others. There comes a time when people get tired of being trampled by oppression. Freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Violence as a way of achieving racial justice is both impractical and immoral. 
It is a descending spiral, ending in destruction for all. The old law of an eye for an eye leaves everybody blind. Nonviolence is the answer to the crucial political and racial questions of our time. We must pursue peaceful ends through peaceful means. We must see that peace represents a sweeter music, a cosmic melody that is far superior to the discords of war. Every step toward the goal of justice requires sacrifice, suffering, and struggle. It is still one of the tragedies of human history that the children of darkness are frequently more determined and zealous than the children of light. A man who won't die for something is not fit to live. If you are cut down in a movement, that is designed to save the soul of a nation, then no other death could be more redemptive. We must develop and maintain the capacity to forgive. There is some good in the worst of us and some evil in the best of us. When we discover this, we are less prone to hate our enemies. The only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend is love. Love is that force which all of the great religions have seen 
as the supreme unifying principle of life. Love is somehow the key that unlocks the door to ultimate reality. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord.
shattered dreams are the hallmark of our mortal life. One of the most agonizing problems within our human experience is that few, if any of us, live to see our fondest hopes fulfilled. The hopes of our childhood and the promises of our mature years are unfinished symphonies. So, I say to you, seek God and discover Him and make Him a power in your life. With Him, we are able to rise from the midnight of desperation to the daybreak of joy. I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin or by the content of their character. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. This is our hope. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. <laughs> 